We have seen that Haskell uses lazy evaluation. Technically, this is called outermost reduction. So given an expression of the form f e, Haskell will try to first apply a definition which simplifies the outer function f. So it will compute this argument e only if e is required in the expansion of f. We saw that this allows us to sensibly use infinite lists. So we wrote this function infinite list which generates the list of the form 0, 1, 2 and so on without stopping. Right? At every point n generates the value n followed by the infinite list starting at n plus 1. Now though this is an infinite list and it takes an infinite time to compute and therefore the computation of this infinite list function does not terminate, we can apply sensible functions to it and get answers in a finite amount of time. For instance, if we take the head of an infinite list of this form, it only needs to generate the first element. So once it has expanded this function once, it finds it has 0 followed by the infinite list starting from, n from 1. And since it has the first element, it can terminate and tell us that the head of this infinite list is 0. Similarly, if I ask to take the first two elements, it will apply this definition twice and once it has generated two elements, it will return the list 0, 1 without trying to evaluate the entire argument. So this list range notation that we said from m to n can be used to generate infinite lists by leaving out the upper bound. So if you write m dot dot, it means the infinite list m, m plus 1, m plus 2 and so on. So, so far we saw only one curiosity involving this which is an implementation of the sieve algorithm by Eratosthenes for computing all the primes. So today let's look at a couple of examples which illustrate why it is sometimes convenient to think in terms of functions which generate unbounded lists rather than worry about how to make them bounded. Our first example comes from the area of graph theory. So a graph is a picture like we see here. We have vertices say A, B, C, D and they are connected by these arrows which are called edges. In this particular graph the arrows are directed so we have an edge from A to B but not necessarily an edge from B to A. One could also consider undirected graphs in which we just specify that A and B are connected but we won't describe in which direction. So for this example we will work with directed graphs. So we can represent a directed graph in Haskell by a function which tells us which pairs of vertices are connected by an edge. For convenience we just use characters as names of vertices. So the edge relation tells us given the first vertex A for example and the second vertex B is there an edge or not. So in this case for instance since there is an edge from D to E we would have an entry in our relation in our edge function saying that edge of D E is true. So we now exhaustively enumerate all the edges in our graph. So our graphs are finite so there will only be a finite number of edges. And then we have a default rule which says that any pair of vertices which is not mentioned explicitly in the function edge is not connected. So if it is not one of the pairs that we have described so far, edge is false. In particular, this also includes vertices whose names are not mentioned here like w, x, y, z, etc. So what we want to check in such a graph is connectivity. So we want to write a function connected which takes two vertices and tells us whether these two vertices are connected by or not by a path. So connected of x, y is true if and only if there is a path from x to y using the given set of edges. In other words, we start at x, we follow some edge, follow another edge and so on. There is a very convenient inductive definition of paths. We can say that x and z are connected if we can find an intermediate vertex y such that we can get from x to y by some path and then extend this path by a single edge to the vertex z. Unfortunately, this definition is not that easy to translate in a language like Haskell because we need to search for this intermediate y. 
in some languages like for example in logic programming this is a natural part of the way logic programming logic programs execute but in functional programming this is not very convenient so we need an alternative way to achieve the same effect so what we will do is we will start building up paths of longer and longer lengths so inductively we start with the empty path of length 0 so for us length will be the number of vertices in a path right so a path of length 0 has nothing in it and now what we said before is that if we had already a path of length k from x to y we can extend it by one extra edge to a path of length k plus 1 so we will build up all paths of length k plus 1 by extending paths of length k so here is a function to do this so let us use path as a definition for a list of characters so a path is nothing but a list of vertices so if we have a list of vertices v1 v2 up to vk this is a path provided v1 to v2 is an edge v2 to v3 is an edge and so on okay and finally vk minus 1 to vk is an edge so such a list in which every pair of adjacent vertices is connected by an edge will denote a path so what we want to say is that if we have paths of length k we want to construct paths of length k plus 1 so initially if we have no paths right so if the only paths we have is the empty path then the paths of length 1 are precisely those which consist of all the vertices in our graph in our graph we have specifically vertices a to f in general you might want to have a uh, a name for this and plug it in but we will just explicitly use the list a to f to denote the vertices in our graph so the paths of length 1 we specify explicitly as paths consisting of the single vertex c where c ranges from a to f now supposing we have paths a path of length k okay so p is of length k then the extensions of p consists of adding a vertex at the end of the list such that this vertex is connected to the last vertex in p so in other words i can add to this list i can add a, a vk plus 1 provided vk to vk plus 1 is so it says take the last vertex in p and append a c at the end provided last of p is connected to c by an h So if we now take all the paths of length k and extend them, then we will get all the paths of length k plus 1. So remember that if I have a single path of length k, then this is going to give me a list of paths of length k plus 1. Right? So now in general, if I have many paths of length k, and I apply this function to each of them, then I will get a list here of extensions of P1. I will get a list here of extensions of P2, and I get a list here of extensions of PL, right? So in general, if I extend every path which belongs to the given list, I will get a list of lists, but I want a single list. So I want this list to be a single list, so I need to dissolve these brackets. So I apply a concat, right? So if I extend the empty list, then I get the list consisting of singleton paths. In general, if I have a list consisting of paths which are not singletons, I extend each one of them right? and then I dissolve the brackets by using concat, which is the same as saying that I collect together for every path in my original list and every extension of that path, I collect that path in a single list. So these are two equivalent ways of saying the same thing but basically we are expanding each element into a list and then we are combining all these lists into a single list by using concat. So to continue we need to generate these paths inductively starting from the empty list and a very useful built-in function in Haskell is something called iterate. So what iterate does is it takes a function and applies it repeatedly to an argument to generate larger and larger values. 
So this function has to be able to take an input, take its output and feed it back. So I get, for instance, initially f applied to x zero times, then I get f applied to x once, then I get f applied to x twice and so on. So since the output of the function must be compatible as an input, this is f of the output of f of x, the iterate must take an argument of type A and return argument of the same type. So we have a function which basically returns an argument of the same type. It takes an initial value and it iterates the application of f 0, 1, 2, 3 times and builds an infinite list of this form. So to generate all paths, it now suffices to iterate this extend all starting with the empty path. So if I do extend all with the empty path, once I will get paths of length 1. If I then extend all paths of length 1, I will get paths of length 2 and so on. So in this way, if I iterate this, I will get p of length 0, all paths of length 1, paths of length 2 and so on. So once we have a way of generating the next set, we can just iterate that function to generate paths of all lengths. Now the first observation we can make in a finite graph is that there is no need to examine paths with loops. For example, supposing I want to get from A to C and I find that I can go from A to B and then I go to some D and then D allows me to go back to B and then I come back to D and then I go to C. So this constitutes a loop where I go to a vertex and I come back to the vertex I started from. We could have longer loops. Now notice that if I eliminate this going around this loop twice, if I just go from B to D to C, that's also a valid path. So if there is a loop along the path from A to C, then that loop can be eliminated and I still have a path from A to C. So in other words, I don't need to look for paths with loops. Now if I don't need to look for paths with loops, then I claim that we only need to look for paths of length n. Because if I have a path of length n, which looks like v1, v2 up to vn, then at best I can have n distinct vertices. So now if I have a new vertex n plus 1, then this vertex must be the same as some other vertex before. So this corresponds to having a loop. So if there is a loop free path at all, it can have at most length n. So it can have at most n minus 1 edges between them. So remember that all paths generates paths of length 0, paths of length 1 and so on. So if I want to go to paths of length n, then it suffices to look at the first n plus 1 entries in the list generated by iterate. So all paths has all paths of all possible lengths. If I take the first n plus 1 entries, I only get paths of length 0 to n. Now the next thing we need to observe is that paths of length 0 and 1 are not really paths. A path of length 0 is just an empty path. A path of length 1 is just a single vertex. It's not taking us from anywhere to anywhere else. So we can further refine this by saying that we will ignore all paths of length 0 and 1. So we take all paths up to length n but then we drop the first two elements in this list. So we drop the paths, the empty path, the path of length 0 and all paths of length 1. So here we have paths of length 2 to n. Right? So any path has at least one edge in it, any useful path. A path with one edge consists of a vertex that starts the path and a vertex that ends the path. So I will have a length of path of length 2 as a minimum and n is my maximum because I am looking for paths without loops. Finally, I would like to extract the endpoints of all these paths. So this is all. So what I will now describe is the final function we want. We want all pairs which are connected by paths. So we will first take n to be the length of our set of vertices. 
then the first parts of length up to 0 to n are take n plus 1 of all parts. All parts itself iterates the extend all function we wrote before. From this we drop parts of length 0 and 1. Okay, So we take all such parts. This is parts of length 2 to n. And for each such path, we pick up the first vertex and the last vertex and say that this pair is connected by a path. Finally, our actual function connected, which we wanted to write, which said given two vertices, are they connected by a path? Just ask whether the pair x, y belongs to the set of connecting pairs. And it's not the set actually, but a list. So the same thing might appear different times. But connected pairs will basically give us every pair when I can go from A to B by a path of length at most n. Now, in general, connected pairs will have duplicates. For instance, if I have a path like this and I might have another path like this. Okay, So then it might say that if I have a graph in which my picture has a direct edge from A to B and it also has so if I have a graph like this red one, then connected pairs will say A to B is connected by a path of length 2. It is also connected by a path of length 3. So connected pairs in general will have duplicates. But as long as the pair A to B appears at least once in this list, I will declare it to be connected. The nice thing about this function is that we don't have to think too much beyond the observation that we want loop-free paths. Extend all actually does generate loops, but we don't care. So supposing we did have the earlier picture or a similar picture like this. Okay. And maybe there are more edges like this. So in such a situation, we would iterate extend all until we get parts of length six. But one of the parts of length six will be, for instance, the path A to B to C to A to B to C. So this will be a path with loops. But we don't particularly care if we generate paths which are with loops as long as we generate all paths which don't have loops. So if we iterate this graph, uh, this extend all function six times on this graph, we are sure that every path without a loop will be found. In the process, we might find redundant paths with loops, but we don't care. <clears throat> so the graph that we had drawn before again, ABC, ABC is a path which exists when we iterate the extend all function six times. So all we want to ensure is that we find every valid path connecting vertices in our graph. And this will definitely be enumerated by step n plus 1. So just as an aside, connected is said to be the reflexive and transitive closure of the edge relation. So in general, if I have a set of vertices and I have some relation connecting them, it actually can be abstractly represented by a graph. So any relation it consists of pairs of elements from a set is just an edge relation of some graph. The graph, the graph representing the edge relation represents the relation itself. And reflexive transitive closure is a set of all connected things. So for instance, we could have a list of people. Right? So we could have a person, maybe A, whose children are B and C. And C in turn has children D and E. So in this case, the edge relation reflects parent and child. And the reflective, reflexive and transitive closure describes the ancestor relation. That is, A is an ancestor of E. So what we have shown is that using iterate and extend all, we can compute the reflexive transitive closure of any edge relation using this type of an action. So in general, a class of problems for which this infinite list technology is useful are the so-called search problems. So we have a space of solutions that we can generate in some form. And we are looking for a particular solution with a property that we, are look, that we require among the space of solutions. So what in general we would do is we would keep expanding solutions. And then when we reach a, we are looking for a certain pattern, either we find the pattern or we may find that the solution we are currently expanding has no expansions possible. So we go back and try another one. And this is a general strategy called backtracking. 
So one of the most famous problems which is used to illustrate backtracking is that of placing n queens on an n by n chessboard. So normally we work with 8 by 8 chessboards. Our chess is played on an 8 by 8 chessboard and of course you have only one queen. The rule for a queen is that a queen can attack any other piece which is on the same diagonal, same row or same column. So now we imagine that we have 8 queens to place on an 8 by 8 chessboard such that no two queens attack each other. So in particular because any two queens on the same row and the same column will attack each other, each queen must be on a different row and a different column. But we have exactly as many queens as columns. So if we have n queens and we have n rows and n columns, a simple argument tells us that we must have exactly one queen in each row and in each column. Because if we have two queens in any row, then we have a problem. If we have no queens in some row or column, then we must have two queens in some other row or column and we have a problem. So here is a heuristic to generate all possible solutions. Right? You place the first queen somewhere in the first row and in each succeeding row you place a queen at the leftmost square that is not attacked by any of the earlier queens. So suppose we have an 8 by 8 chessboard and we start with a queen at the top left corner. Now we have to place a second queen in this row. Now this is in the same column as the previous queen. This is in the same diagonal. So the first place that we can put a queen is here. So we place a queen there. Now we will find that these squares are all ruled out. Right? So this is attacked by the first queen. This is attacked by the second queen. So now when we come to the third row, okay, the only place we can put a queen starting from the left is here, the first place we can put a queen. So we put a queen there. And continuing this way, we can put a queen on the fourth row, a queen on the fifth row, a queen on the sixth row, a queen on the seventh row. And now, unfortunately, we cannot put a queen here, which is the normal place, because it is on the same diagonal as the very first queen we put. Right? So we are stuck. So we cannot generate a potential solution. So what we have to do at this point is backtrack. We have to take this and say that, at this point, the last thing we did was to put a 7th queen, so can we put it somewhere else? So we backtrack and then if we can't do anything else, we backtrack one more and we change this value and so on. Right? So this is what backtracking means. You generate a solution as far as you can go. If you are lucky, you generate a good one. If you are unlucky, you get stuck. If so, you go back and undo the last thing you did, retry that value. If you can't get anything for all possible choices of that second last value, go back to the third last value and so on. So what we want to do is use infinite lists in a way that we don't have to explicitly worry about backtracking. So the first thing we need is some way of representing the state of a board with some queens on it. Since we are going from the first row to the last row, okay, we can always describe the current queens on the board in terms of a list. Right? So let us, because of Hassel terminology, number the, in this case, the eight queens the rows as 0 to 7 and the columns as also 0 to 7. Okay, So there are 8 rows and 8 columns which are numbered 0 to 7. So the list position 0 refers to row 0. Where is the queen in row 0? So it will be a number between 0 and 7 again because it is the column of that queen. So this says that the queen in row 0 is in column 0. This says the queen in row 1 because it's the position 1. So these are the positions, right? So the positions are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So row 1 is in column 2. Row 2 is in column 4 and so on. So this is saying exactly what we said before, which is that we have on the top left corner we have a queen, then we skip 2 and then we have a queen, then we skip 2 more and we have a queen and so on. So this is a representation of the 7 queens that we managed to place before we got stuck. And now when we want to place the k plus 1th queen, we have to take a list of the first k queens and add one new queen, a new position for the new element. We have to extend the list by one element. The new number is the column position of the new queen. Now the new queen should not be, it is by implicitly because it is a new position, it is in a new row. So it is not on the same row as any of the earlier column uh, queens. But we should not put it in the same column because if it is the same column, it will be attacked by a previous queen. And we also need to check it's not on the same diagonal. 
Now it turns out that diagonals you can do a little bit of arithmetic. So if you have a diagonal of this form, okay, so for example you have the diagonal 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2 and so on. All of these have a common difference of 0. If I look at the diagonal starting at say 0, 1, 1, 2 and so on, then all of these have a common difference of 1. So if you have a diagonal of this form going from top right, left to bottom right, then all entities on the diagonal will have the same r minus c value. Symmetrically, if you do all diagonals that look like this, then you will have the same sum. So for instance, you'll have 0, 7, then 1, 6, 5, 2, 5 and so on. Right? So all these are on one diagonal and they all add up to 7. So it's quite easy to check whether a queen is in the same column as an earlier queen. You just have to check the number is not present in the list you have so far. But to check on the same diagonal, you just have to add the position to the column number and make sure or subtract the position from the column number and make sure that that difference or that sum is not seen before. So this extend function, we will not write it explicitly, but it's easy to write such an extend function which takes a given list of k queens and returns, if possible, a k plus 1th position for the new queen. So now, as we did with the graph, we can start with a queen, a position which has no queens on it and iteratively extend it and we know that we have to place n queens. So if we extend this n times, then we end up with the first one is the empty board, the second is all possible configurations with one queen, the third is all possible configurations with two queens and so on. And so the n plus one entry will be the list of all configurations on which we have placed all n queens, right? So n plus one because I start from zero. So this is f, f of n, f2 of n and so on, right? So at the end, I will have extended it n times. So I placed n queens and now we have not said anything about which solution we want. So it's enough to compute, say, the first element of that. So we want at least one solution with n queens. So you iteratively extend the empty board until you get all n queens on it and just take the head of that list. So that will be a list of all possible arrangements of n queens which do not attack each other and we just take the first one. So notice that the backtracking problem is avoided implicitly. If we come up with a, an arrangement of k queens where k is smaller than n and there is no way to extend it, then the extend function will just reduce that to an empty list. So that candidate solution will just disappear. So what we are doing is rather than going back and generating a new solution, we are in one shot generating all possible candidate solutions, those which die out, die out, those which do not die out, survive, and we check which all one, which all solutions survive in n plus 1 steps. So in a sense, our solution consists of exploring the graph of all possible arrangements in a breadth first way. So we generate all possible solutions where we have placed one queen in the first row. Then for each of these we expand it so we get a second level of this tree which generates all possible solutions of two queens in the first two rows, three queens in the first three rows and so on. So this looks like a fairly inefficient strategy because we are going to first compute all the solutions of one row then all the solutions of two rows and all the solutions of three rows in order to reach finally the first solution of the eighth row. But this is where now lazy evaluation will actually do the job for us. Because what lazy evaluation will do is it will say, okay, if I want the first solution, let me see if the first solution comes from the first solution in the first row. Then let me see if that solution comes from the first expansion of that. Then let me see if the first comes from that. So actually, though we are programming a breadth first search over this tree of all possible solutions, lazy evaluation actually does a depth first search and finds the first solution without evaluating all. Of course, if I want all the solutions, I have no choice but to evaluate everything, but I'm only interested in one solution, any one solution according to the enumeration I have, then lazy evaluation does depth first search and effectively finds us the first solution without trying to compute all the solutions in between. Right? So we have seen that infinite lists are more than just a curiosity of lazy evaluation. They are actually a useful way to think about search problems. So instead of worrying about backtracking and deciding when something has a particular property, we can iteratively generate all solutions up to a desired depth and then ask how many such solutions are there or pick one. And in particular, we saw 
that lazy evaluation converts what seemingly is an inefficient breadth-first search over the tree of all solutions into a depth-first eva depth evaluation of the leftmost solution. So actually, lazy evaluation buys us an efficient way to execute our rather inefficient strategy. 